In the last episode of this series documenting the construction of my new cowboy boots by legendary bootmaker Lee Miller of Texas Traditions, we saw Lee create one of the most defining characteristic of a bespoke boot, the hand-sewn welt. This small strip of leather is the backbone of a pair of handmade shoes or boots, allowing them to be easily resold over their lifetime. In today's video, we see Lee finish the bottom making, sewing the outsole onto the half welt and pegging the waist with wooden pegs. So join me as we're invited inside Lee's workshop to see him practice his incredible craft. So Kirby, um, today is day four of the filming and uh, what I'm, what the boots have been inseamed and all my filler has been put in. I've got, a, I've got a 40 penny nail that's in here. I've got a leather shank over it. I've got my four part filler. So now I've got my cement on and I'm gonna put the soles on today. I'm gonna go ahead and sew the soles, wooden peg them, trim them, and that'll be the extent of what we're doing today. So. Okay, so I've got a little water. These, these soles have been cased, so they're nice and mellow. Um, but I put a little water on there just to wake them up. And you can see how flexible they are. And there's many ways to do this. And this is really an easy step. I want to make sure that this kind of just folds down nicely into the shank so I can mold it. And a lot of times you'll see that shoe and boot makers will go ahead and use straps. And this is just a very simple way of pulling it down into the shank. You'll see a lot of people will go ahead and use a hammer for the four part, but honestly, a simple stick works well and avoids any unsightly hammer marks. So, I'm going to run this through the welt press and then just set it down and I'll. So this is a welt press. So everybody used diff different knives. This is a lip knife because it has a lip. And so we'll break it down into sections. Okay, so the four part's been trimmed. Now we'll do the back heel. This is all just done by eye. There's no measuring. And everything that I'm doing is just to get it to a certain point. There's, no, there's not much precision in this part. It's just trimming it bigger than you actually need it. Okay, there we go. Now the medial shank, or I'm sorry, excuse me, the lateral shank. This is the lateral shank. The lateral shank is the easiest thing to do. And so, I'll use a variety of tools to do it. 
Let's see, we'll put this coffee there so we don't get any water in it. Okay, so a little water. Then this is a welt knife. This is German. So it's now starting to take shape. And this is all done according to the shape of the foot. You can see how that's already starting to look nice. We'll put a little water on it. You can, you can glaze it with a tool. So you can see the diff see how this has been worked on and so the medial shank is the hardest thing to trim and that requires a, l a lot more skill because it's more vague the interesting thing is that no one has ever filmed this part of the boot making before. So see, I'm, fe I'm feeling where is the insole, and I'm also looking at it to see if I like the shape. It's a little bit full here still. So it, it, may, it may take a minute or two just to get it to where I like it. Good. So same thing, glaze it. And then you can use your, your hand, make it look a little prettier. Okay, so this one is done. So here we are now with the boots at this step. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shape the soles and then sew them. Ready to sew. So this machine goes back to 1977. So this is the bobbin. Now we need to run a sample.
So the machine cut a channel as I sewed. This is flax thread. You want to make sure that you fall in the channel. So you've got to, you can't, the angle in which you hold it will either allow you to fall into the channel or will go ahead and um, have you miss the channel. Because this is a curved surface, I'm constantly changing angles to keep it level. And so I've got to go ahead and do that so that I can stay in that channel. And as you can see, the machine um, can be quite fast. So you've really got to, you know, it's speed, but it's also ad constantly adapting as you move. Um, generally speaking, as you go around the toe, that's when the most likely chance is the angle might be wrong and you'll fall out of the channel. This machine has been here since 1977. Um, it was purchased, rebuilt by Charlie Dunn, and we've been using it ever since. Uh, it's needed just a little bit of maintenance, but for the most part, it's a very reliable sewing machine. Uh, it weighs 900 pounds, so it's quite heavy. So it takes a lot of people to move it. So this is referred to as a, as a curved needle, and this is an aristocrat, that's the model. So it's a Landis 12L aristocrat. These machines have been built since probably 1900. So this machine is probably, I mean, this a basic model similar to this would be about 120 years old. Every tool that you get came from somewhere. This was a shoemaker from Dallas. His name was Carl Litke. And this uh, rubbing stick is, uh, I've had this for a long time. And you find lots of different uses for these tools. Not only is a rubbing stick, it can be used to close channels. So a little bit of water. This is a very unusual tool. And this tool is so old that when I called them the maker, they had to go into their museum to try and find out what this tool was. So they have a museum of all their unused tools. So this is officially a channel closer, but it looks like a little mitt, you know? So, but that's its function. So um, I found this in just an old toolbox
So you'll notice I use water quite a bit, and water will make leather swell, and that it also allows you to rub out any marks. So as a reference, we can look at the difference. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and um, on this, I'm gonna just go ahead and hammer this closed. And we talked about this, I'm not using a hammer here because a lot of times um, you'll dent the leather with your hammer. I'm just gonna go ahead and do what's called setting the stitch. So anytime you sew, you have to set the stitch. The next step for me is to go ahead and wooden peg these. And then I'll go ahead and f fudge this. And then I'm gonna dye the stitches black. And then I'll be done. This is a pegging awl. And this is a little tiny rubber bumper that's been put on. And every time I use it, I'm gonna be putting it in this beeswax. That'll kind of lubricate it as I use it. So we've got a pegging awl and some beeswax, and these are from Germany. These wooden pegs are a certain size. They're a five and a half, 12. And so I'm gonna do two rows in the shank and one row in the heel seat. And we'll first go ahead and mark a beginning and an ending. So there's a beginning and an ending. And let's find the tool. This is a stitch marker. And this, I believe, is a, I think it's a five. It's either a five or a six. Anyway. And rather than using a guide, I'm just using my finger. So I'm going three eighths of an inch from the edge. And I'm gonna make sure that in the heel seat, I'm in. So there's no nails. This is all wooden pegs. Then I'll build the heels. So this was sewn. Now we'll peg this. One of the things in a cowboy boot is, uh, this is called a half welt a peg shank in a, in, you know, in, and whenever you ride a horse, this part of it is very critical. So it's style and function. So in a dress shoe, this might be sewn back to here. You might have a welt that goes back to here to where the heel is built in a cowboy boot in a traditional cowboy boot. Normally you'll see it a, a half welt, a wooden peg shank. So that's really, so it's style but it's also function. Uh, so you want a nice narrow waist um, and usually the way to, to do that is just a wooden peg it. So we've got this beautiful shank. See how fat that shank is. So this is good for, uh, for, riding, for horseback riding. 
the nice thing about using wooden pegs as opposed to a nail, a nail is always going to be a nail. At some point, um, the insole might lose a little bit of moisture, and so it's going to get a little bit thinner. So the nail will become proud, and it'll stick up, and it will, uh, you'll feel it. But a wooden peg is not going to do that. Another nice aspect of a wooden peg is when the sole gets wet, the leather will swell. When the wooden peg gets wet, the, leather, the wooden peg also will swell. So that's why a wooden peg is going to move with the sole. It's going to go through the outsole, everything in between, and just come up just a little bit inside. And then at that point, we'll sand down the inside. So it's, it's a very good way, like you'll see that some houses are built uh, with dowels instead of nails. This is a, if, if I was to nail this, that would be regarded as a cheaper way to make a boot. Now you can nail it, um, but knowing that the nail is eventually gonna stick up in your foot. Um, the way that factories get away with using nails here is that they'll have a metal plate on the last and then the nail will bend over and brad, and then they'll put a sock liner in it to cover all that. So wooden pegs um, are just, it's more labor to use a wooden peg than it is to use a nail. Nails are much quicker, but it's just a cheaper way to do it with something. So this is just, this is more labor, but it's a nicer way of doing it. There is one bootmaker that does three rows of wooden pegs in the shank. I just do two. Most, most bootmakers just do two. So you'll see, I just keep putting it back in the wax. So I might do three holes and then uh, we'll stagger them now. Wooden pegs don't come out. Um, you might see the wooden pegs swell a little bit, which is normal. And uh, if a lot of my customers would, would call me up and they'll say, Lee, there's nails in the shank. And I say, well, no, there's no nails in that. That's what you're feeling, the wooden pegs. So literally you just go in there with a little piece of sandpaper and just sand them down again. And it's nothing. It's just if, if you sweat a lot, if, if there's a lot of humidity where you live or you, you tend to perspire a lot, the wooden pegs might swell a little bit. You will see some makers uh, put a little bit of cement in the holes or, or glue, um, paste. Generally, it's cement that they're using, an all-purpose cement, because they're thinking that the, the wooden pegs are going to come out. I've never had any wooden pegs ever come out. So you can see what I'm doing. Simply now putting in a, an, a, another row, every other, just staggering it. These take a little bit of, well, there's a little learning curve mm -hmm. in terms of how to use them. And you have to know what part of the hammer will come in contact with the wooden peg. So I'm, if I'm hitting it like this, not centered, but here. So you have to, there's a certain amount of feeling with it where you have to feel your way through where is the contact with the wooden peg. But if you notice what I'm doing is I am tapping it to get it started and then driving it. And if for one, for one odd reason you break a peg, you simply make a new hole in the same spot. Okay? And it's, it's quite simple. These soles that I'm using are a little thin. 
This is more of a dress sole. So because of it, the pegs are going to break a little bit. They're not going to go completely in. There we go. But you can see how these, so there we go. But you can see how quite a bit is going in. But it'll never be felt because we will go ahead and sand the inside. Okay, I'm done pegging this and the outsole is fully secure. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do what's called fudging or some people refer to it as pricking. And we'll put a little water here just to make it nice and pretty, make it a little softer. And then I'm going to use two, two I'm going to brace it with this, this little leather pad. And this is a tool designed for fudging. This is just going to go in between each step. This serves, this is technically to tighten the stitches, but it also makes it look pretty. I'm using it primarily just to make it look pretty. So after doing that, it will take about f five minutes. This tool is to do it by hand. If I use a fudging wheel, it's not going to line up exactly. So that's why this doing it by hand is a little bit better. Now, if I use the fudging wheel to base the hand sewing of the sole on, the fudging wheel would line up, but I didn't do it that way. So we need to do it by hand. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to go ahead and lightly tap it with a hammer. And then I'm going to dye the stitches black. And I'll be done. So I'm going to dye this black. So I'm going to very carefully dye my stitching. Because I'm using flax, as opposed to synthetic, flax dies beautifully. Synthetic doesn't.
There we go. This one's done. I finished dyeing the boot, and so now the stitching has all been covered up. And this is as far as I'm going to go for today, day four. Uh, overnight, I'm going to allow everything to dry. And in the morning, I'm going to go ahead and start sanding this, building the heels. And by the end of day five, the boots will be done and in the wooden trees where they'll set for the night. So this is day four, putting the soles on, wooden pegging, sewing on the curved needle. So at this point, um, I've got to clean up the rand and because everything is based on the rand. I've got to get that cleaned up nice and level and pretty. And so I'm going to be using, uh, as I said earlier, this beautiful German belt knife and uh, Massachusetts rand file and then an English rand file. After doing a rough sanding of the heel to get the shapes the same, to get the correct pitch in the back and the correct look from the bottom. Now that I'll go with a knife and I'll, sh I'll a sharp knife and I'll trim the excess leather out in the front. After all of the work that I've done, now the finishing part is simply just to rub all the hardware 